we're going to begin to look at Atwood's machines again. And before we get to a true Atwood's where we've got our two hanging masses, let's start simple, if you could call it that. So we're going to look at what's going on when something is rotating, but it's got a rope and a pulley system and how those work. So here's a picture that I think is very good in just describing what's going on. And I'm just going to paraphrase what's in the wording. You have a pulley and this one's rotating clockwise and you have a rope that's not slipping. So what that means is that the rope is moving exactly with the pulley. Think of it, not that this is actually the case, but think of it as just having little tiny grooves and these are just rotating as one. So whenever you have a pulley and a rope on a pulley, the acceleration of the rope and therefore the object on the bottom of the rope is going to equal the acceleration at the rim of the pulley. And when we say the rim, we are referring to tangential acceleration. So see how this is alpha r and omega r? That's just referring to our linear acceleration. So remember, a was r alpha. Our linear velocity was r omega. So the speed of any point on the rim of a pulley is going to equal the speed of the rope and therefore the speed and acceleration of the object. So that's paraphrasing exactly what all of these words say, so I'll just reread them. If a pulley turns without the rope slipping on it, then the rope speed will match the speed of the rim of the pulley and because the object attached to the rope is attached to it, it therefore will also have the same speed and acceleration. So let's do an example seeing how all of this works and I'm only going to do the one example because it is a little bit of a longer one. Josh has just raised a 2.5 kilogram bucket of water using a Wells winch. So that's what the uh, spinning thing that you would turn the handle on a well to get a bucket up, winch, using a Wells winch when he accidentally lets go of the handle. The winch consists of a rope wrapped around a 3 kilogram, 4 centimeter diameter cylinder, which rotates on an axle through the center. The bucket is released from rest 4 meters above the water level of the well, and we want to know how long it takes to reach the water. So here's a diagram of what's going on. It also lists the given and find in there. So we know that it's rotating from the way the picture drew it counterclockwise. The bucket is moving down, so delta y for the bucket, because it's going down, is negative 4 meters. It's starting from rest, so the initial is 0. The mass of the bucket is 2.5 kilograms. And then it tells us that the diameter of the winch is 4 centimeters, therefore the radius is 2 centimeters which is equal to 0 0.02 meters, and the mass of the winch is 3 kilograms. Usually when we're going to see problems like this, the rope will be massless, but the pulley itself will have a mass and a radius. So before, when we were doing Atwood's machines, we were always looking at massless pulleys. Now we're going to be looking at pulleys that actually have a mass, and because they have a mass, they can have a torque because they are now rotating. So I'm just going to write the word given up here because those are all of our given values. And what we're looking for in the end is time. So we're going to have to use rotational kinematics, normal kinematics, and rotational dynamics. So let's start with the bucket. And if I draw a force diagram for the bucket, it's got its weight and the tension force. We know that tension is shorter than the weight because this bucket is accelerating downward, so the downward force has to be larger. And net force is going to equal top minus bottom, so FT minus FG. Mass times, this acceleration is negative because it's getting faster in the negative direction. 
So mass times negative acceleration equals Ft minus Fg negative Ma plus Mg equals Ft. So all I did, Fg equals Mg, brought it from here over to the other side. Factoring out the M, we get M times G minus A equals the tension force. And this is the mass of the bucket. So we're dealing with two different masses. Let's actually put the B in here to show this is the mass of the bucket. So mass of the bucket times G minus A is equal to the tension force. Now let's look at the cylinder. They drew kind of a 3D. I'm just going to draw a head-on view of this. So we have the cylinder. It's rotating that way, counterclockwise. And we've got the tension force right here, which is causing the torque. And this is the same tension force as this tension force because right here, it's the same rope of the bucket that's causing the cylinder to rotate. So we know that for the cylinder, the torque is equal to the tension force times the radius. And this is the radius of the cylinder, and it's the only force acting on this that's causing a torque. So your torque is equal to, oh, I'm sorry, and it's also at a 90 degree angle. So we don't have to worry about sine theta. So your torque is equal to the tension force times the radius. And we know that torque is also equal to the moment of inertia times angular acceleration. So the tension force equals moment of inertia times alpha over the radius. Using our older stuff, we know that acceleration equals R alpha. So acceleration over R equals alpha. So substituting this in for alpha, we get Ft equals I times A over R over R. And just simplifying that a little bit, tension force equals I times A over R squared. Okay, simplifying this even more, so let's make another substitution. It's a cylinder. Moment of inertia, so I for a cylinder, equals one half m r squared. So substituting one half m r squared in for I, we get Ft equals one half m r squared times A over r squared. So tension force equals one half m, this is mass of the cylinder, so I'm going to put mc times a. Okay, so we know that Ft equals one half mc times a, and we know that Ft also equals the mass of the bucket times g minus a. This is a known, this is a constant, this is a known, this is what we're solving for. So two equations, two unknowns. I have Ft isolated, it's irrelevant, so I'm just gonna set this equal to this, giving us Mb times G minus A equals one half Mc times A. From here, it's just algebra. So 2mbg minus 2mba equals mca, getting all the a's to the same side, 2mbg, that should be a g, equals mca plus 2mba, 
2 MBG over MC plus 2 MB equals A. This has been quite the algebra adventure. 2 times the mass of the bucket, 2.5 kilograms, times G, 9.8 newtons per kilogram, over mass of the cylinder, 3.5 kilograms, plus 2 times 2.5 kilograms, equals my acceleration. And this is actually 3.0, not 3.5. So 2 times 2.5 is 5, 5 times 9.8 is 49, 49 divided by 8 is going to give us 6.125 meters per second squared for acceleration. This was a linear acceleration, not an angular acceleration, so it makes sense that this is what the units come out to. So we know what the acceleration of the pulley is and therefore the acceleration of the bucket as it's falling. So now we can go to our old kinematics. Delta Y equals one half A T squared. But we're not in free fall even though we're using delta Y. However, we figured out what acceleration is. We know delta Y we're looking for T. So two times delta Y over A equals T squared. Now, because this is a bucket, it's moving down, it's getting faster in the negative. Up here, I put in the negative A, so that means that down here, this should be a negative acceleration. All we were solving for was the magnitude of the acceleration, so just like when we used to do Atwood's machines problems, me putting in the negative solved for the magnitude of the acceleration of the system. So we solved for the magnitude of the acceleration. I put the negative in earlier, but it is important that we recognize this negative here for when we use the kinematic equation. So we get 2 times negative 4 meters divided by negative 6.125 meters per second squared for t squared. And this is why I needed that negative here, because you can't take the square root of a negative number. 8 divided by 6.125 meters per second squared is going to give me 1.306, keeps on going, second squared for t squared. Taking the square root of that number, we get 1.142, keeps on going, seconds for t. So how long does it take this bucket to fall? out of room. T is approximately equal to 1.1 second. It was a lot that we were dealing with with the problem, um, very algebraic in terms of things that we had to substitute. We will do more of these so that you can get used to the process of solving but I can guarantee you'll see more problems like this, and then it'll be a little bit more complicated when we're adding in um, a second object and looking at a real Atwoods machine.